Thank you very much. And that sounds, doesn't sound like me sometimes when I listen to what I've done. And I'd like to thank you indeed for inviting me for this first inaugural lecture. As I stood in the building, and I, I was just saying earlier just now, I did, the first thing I did when I walked into the building was walk in and touch the walls and say, has that a co got a coating on it? What's it like? And it, it made me feel happy, made me feel proud, and also feel we've got a new building for a facility that's going to then help both our innovation, our creativity, and also the next generation. And it made me feel, I suppose, humbled because often we haven't always had the opportunity to build new facilities for, um, for U the UK in this environment. So I did take a breath and I also looked outside and, and I thought, oh, it does com complement the landscape. And I heard about the trees and I heard about the size of the buildings and everything and I thought, I almost felt I, I belonged and understood what, the amount of um, passion that there was in putting this building together. So I looked at it and thought, well, who are these owners of these buildings and who is the important person around this? And I thought undergraduates, postgraduates, staff and financiers, everyone had that part to play, belonging and actually wanting it to succeed, but also the local borough and the people around. So it is that collaboration, that whole piece around thinking together and doing it, because it can't happen by one alone. So where does engineering play in its central role in advancing civilization? And I'm going to take us a little bit back through human history. We can use modern examples, speed of change in technology, and also looking at the history of engineering. There was key transformation in artisanship and using art and creativity in the domination of machine power for manufacturing, for agriculture, and the extraction of natural resources. We look to automation to replace repetitive and labour-intensive systems to improve health, well-being and mobility. However, that does come at a cost to our planet and our environment. And that equally stands us in thinking about what we want to do for our planet and improve it. This wide, wide and profound area of health and well-being as an element of where we want to go. And I was also having this thought... Our aim is to have smart cities, our aim is to have cleaner cities, our aim is all to have that innovation, but at what cost? Because what we do know, that the population is ever increasing to that 10 billion mark, and that being so by the middle of the century. The benefits of economic and social progress are not distributed equally. We know that. A billion people without access to safe drinking water, two and a half billion without sanitation, and then four billion having no internet access, placing them on the wrong side of the digital divide, which we take for granted. So addressing these issues are a challenge for us. We're, we have this inquiring minds as engineers, as, as applied scientists, as people just generally, wanting to seek that creative way of thinking to such complex problems. We want to also find ways of disrupting. And I'd say that even more so, we, exp we actually find that in the, new, in the younger generation here and now, Chal challenging the core compliance around the s sustainable, equitable and safe, being the three parts that hold that th thread together. So going back to me, who am I? Yes, I'm an engineer who is and has been able to, in my position as the president, um, been able to turn around to CEOs who've sat next to me sometimes and who have turned around and said, I sit in policy, I sit in this, I'm, I'm actually in a law firm or I'm here. And I'll say to them, but were you an engineer? And they'd say, yes. And I said, well, how often do you tell people that you are? How often do you actually say that that's where I came from and I'm using my skills of creative innovation or questioning or problem solving when you actually operate outside of that engineering sphere? Because people don't know that. And when people don't know that, they assume you're in from the legal profession or law profession or whatever. Whereas our counterparts in the legal profession and law profession will often say, I happen to have a background in this field or I have a background in this field. And I think all of us have that responsibility to say that, that that's where our heritage lies. 
that if you cut us, we are engineering like that's that actual rock that you'd have on the Brighton Pier, for example. So I may not be a practicing technical engineer, but boy, did I enjoy walking around the patch today. I asked all sorts of questions, and sometimes it was going whew, over my head. I couldn't really, I couldn't land it, but I certainly could see the passion, could see the interest, and could see the fascination of what was being said. But sometimes I was actually landing it, well, what's going to happen, and when will you take it to market? What will go on, and how will you actually then take it into another sphere? And especially when I spoke to the individuals who were in the, in the space environment, I said, well, how is it they've now worked out that what they're developing in this sector can translate into the automotive sector? And that's the bit sometimes we think this way, and it's the thinking of how we can translate into the other environments that makes it unique. So the Women's Engineering Society, I have that voice and a voice of members. We are a few thousand members and engineering matters. Women's Engineering Society, it's a society that's been going on since it started back in 1919. So it's all, we're almost getting to our centenary. It started at, at the end of the First World War when women had technical jobs. They were fulfilling a lot of the jobs that um, the men weren't around to fulfill. They were there, they enjoyed it, they wanted to continue. However, as you may look, and, and I haven't put slides together because I thought I wanted to talk about us, our colours are based on the suffragettes, society, uh, suffragettes, the green, the vibrancy of the green, the, the purple and the white. So you can see those colours are actually then holding true to the suffragettes. And we were, on the back of the 1919, we wanted women to continue in those technical jobs. And that's what we've actually wanted, wanted to continue and, raise, and have that resonance in positioning that people should consider a wide variety of people when they look for people in working in teams, especially as we think about teams and the way the dynamics work. So that pre-war setting, the end of the war, women were unable to operate in that <coughs> environment, were unable to actually work in the place that they actually belonged. And one of those happens to be Waterloo Bridge, we, often known as the Ladies' Bridge. We know that Waterloo Bridge, there were a lot of welders, there were a lot of people who were involved in that, and that was during the war period. We've worked with the Blue Plaque Society, desperately trying to actually get them recognised and describe it as the, uh, as the Women's Bridge, but to no avail, because of data and, and evidence to support it. But what boy we did try, with a lot of people actually walking across that bridge and demonstrating that they were there, when they're often unsung heroes in those whole, whole environments. So if we look to the future, and this is what I would say, I say we learn from them and take inspiration from the struggle to define the future. Study if the past if you want to define where the future is going to take us. So the pioneering and influencing women of the time set up by the Women's Engineering Society included quite a few people of repute, one being Amy Johnson, per se. We've had a few of them that have actually then, I would say, the women were privileged. They were in um, families where they were able to operate and the men, and men were either in politics or in engineering. They were able to be a voice for women and were able to then take it as a method of being able to be a voice for people who didn't have the ability to actually then work in that environment. And so what I'd say is it has a lot of history and it has a lot of people who feel loyal to that environment because of what it actually stood for. So when I look at the gender mix and the gender mix of today and our operation, we were only yesterday um, no, actually at the weekend we had our trustees meeting and we were saying, okay, so our m and say we can have men. Men are keen to join us. So how are we going to play it? What are we going to do? Are we going to have men and women joining our society or what's the, what's the discussion? So we thought, and this is on the table at the moment and it's not been landed yet. We're talking, well, maybe we aim 11% men. If we can actually play it out where there happens to be 11% women operating in this sphere today, why don't we aim that every time that balance shifts and we start to see the increase in the, in the gender mix, we will start to see and we'll aim 
for a cap as to how many the, the men happen to be. But we don't know whether we'll play that out, but it was certainly a thought that we thought that would actually then get people to recognise that we too feel that we want to have that balance of equality in a different way. But wanting to recognise that men and women play an important part in the collective thought in the way that we want to operate. So, figuratively speaking, I was talking to some um, co small companies and they were turning around and I was actually just discussing this with Andrew earlier where small companies are saying students are coming out of university, their experience is they've got a lot of knowledge and in effect some of the SMEs are not able to actually then help those individuals operate in that space because they're playing catch up. So it's almost as if you're saying well in one space you want people to be leading and in another space you're wanting um, organisations to catch up and there is this sort of <coughs> seesaw effect that we're trying to then work out where sometimes industries are leading and sometimes it happens to be individuals who then get frustrated and who need to actually then find that space. So I would say I'm often asked by individuals who say should I join a large organisation and join their graduate trainee scheme or should I join an SME? And it's a tough one on me and I, I wouldn't say that I'm qualified to make that call but what I would say is that individuals should actually then be given the opportunity to have a go, try something and then try something again and not feel that it's actually wrong to keep trying and then in a, moving on from the area that they've actually originally started. So if we look to Brunel, and I felt I wanted to bring Brunel into this because he did go to school, quite local to here, I believe, in Hove. He didn't pigeonhole himself, but was described as a mechanical and civil engineer. His education was in classics, and he undertook an apprenticeship. So he did recognise that education came for people who wanted to learn, but it wasn't linear. It, wasn't, it was all about the education establishments of continually challenging the norm and how, we actually, how he then considered innovation. So we've got to somehow find that our approach to the way that we look at children's schooling and our ways of learning isn't always going to be block here and do this here and that's what the outcome is and that's what's going to happen. We've just got to keep thinking that the person who is a bit of a disruptor who, or who finds their niche when they're 25 or 30 isn't the one who's gone wayward. What they've done is they've formulated their own path. But it's a tough one on employers when they want to actually have it quite linear and they've gone to that school and they've done this and done that. And I think that's almost challenging the way that we think and how we value people's learning styles. So I then started to ask myself, well, what is it that we get. We, we talked around the city having high individuals of people who are of physics, who have physics as their trade. We also do know that there are high performing autistic people in the city who do have that skill but often don't necessarily have the communication skill to balance that and equally are pigeonholed into this we need to make a special room for those individuals because they may not be able to operate in this general environment but we certainly need those individuals but how do they get into those spots and that's the bit that I'm starting to have discussions with recruiters on because you can't mould your recruitment process in the same fashion for everybody because you won't you'll only get a cookie cutter arrangement so what I would say is let's go back why was it that women's engineering society was who, what was our purpose? Our purpose, supporting the potential of engineers, applied scientists and leaders to re reward excellence, encouraging education and study, but also gender diversity, equality in the workplace and sustaining that legacy for the future effectiveness of women. But a hundred years and we've still got a long way to go. With that aim in mind, one of the things that we are saying now is we'd like to achieve 30% of women in STEM by 2030. Because we feel that once you're at the table and you're able to then get the balance of people, even if that's a still smaller percentage, you're able to influence and able to be heard as a voice. 
Could this 30% ever be achieved or is it an elusive number? Don't know. But what I am finding is people are starting to ask themselves, well, do we have that mix? And especially with the gender pay, we're starting to get more analytics and evidence about this and then saying, is this right? What would I want? And especially, I get this from men who turn around and say, I can't explain it if I've got a daughter. Why on earth would I want my daughter to be any, earning any less than my son? And that's where we've got to start asking those questions. So looking then at the academies and the institutions, I did, still do feel <coughs> it's still very siloed in their approach. It's that even though we have the umbrella of the Royal Academy of Engineering, the respective technical disciplines and the UF report was very much around grasping that integration piece, which it's been out there for, what, a year and a half, this UF report. There are, what, 35 institutions. I don't know how many affiliates. Um, each of them have gotten, you mentioned the IHEM and one of them, and then there's, and then I could, I could just name a whole load. Brunel was linked to two. How often do you get people linking to two? And how often do you actually say, well, I want a bit of this, and I'm on this stool, and I think I want to belong there, and I want to go to their lectures? Even getting them to start talking to each other and saying, let's share the space. Let's go and have a joint lecture together. Let's do some of these things. It's all a little bit precarious. It's, I wouldn't say it's collaboration isn't there as yet. And if we're getting that from the institutions, I think it's got to come from somewhere else. And in a sense, they are trying to protect their own identity and recognising what is their identity and who are they actually then supporting. But then you also say to yourself, well, is it the individuals like the ICE and the IET who actually then play in the big boy space because they're the ones who have the more members and who are the richer ones who haven't lost their IP? What is it that we're trying to work out and are we just trying to say we maintain that technical discipline and they're there to support it as a means of maintaining the engineering professionalism? But, but my story, let's take it back to me for a little bit. Never simple, always loads of twists and turns and I'd say all of us have a story to tell and probably we all do it in a different way. And how often do we have that conversation with individuals where we tell them about all the positive, easy bits where we've succeeded along the way? Don't always tell the bits where it's a little bit tough and a little bit rocky and a little bit... Where you'd question yourself and say, well, was that the right move? Should I have done it that way? I'd say, for me, learning's been at the heart of my resilience, probably. First degree, did I choose the right degree? chose electrical and electronic engineering during the recession, during Maggie Thatcher's period. I wanted to move into construction, but it was the recession, so it wasn't going to be. <laughs> so then joined the graduate trainee scheme at an airport. Definitely wanted to work at an airport because, even, because I wanted to be part of the client environment. How often do people think, do I want to be in the provider or in the client and whatever? But I, that's what I knew. I wanted to be the one who then determined where we'd spend the money, what we'd do and how we'd do it. And, okay, so we did have quite a few airports under our portfolio, so we could say we were a pseudo-monopoly. Uh, from that, I think I was moving every couple of years in that organisation. Why? Probably because I had a mentor, and he was a chief engineer, who wanted me to succeed, but I didn't realise it. And you don't realise it. You don't actually think about who's helping you along the way and you just think it's an easy ride or you think that's what happens to everybody but you don't hear those and I think that's where we need to start explaining it to people and especially to students because people don't hear about some of those where take the opportunity grasp it go and find it go and hunt for it don't assume all of those need to be almost pushed into those spheres and saying look we have a student conference annually every October, November, and I was chatting with um, one of the senior lecturers at Brunel, and they said, we offer 10 spaces. We offer them to go to, and we hold it at Warwick, or we hold it at Aston, one or the other. We hold it there, and it's so tough to get girls to go, because they think they're going to miss out on a lecture, or they're going to miss out on a... 
And the whole point is they come back going, best thing I did. It's that whole networking, but that fear that they're going to then fail what they're doing in that environment. And it's just nudging people to take those steps. And sometimes we need to be there to help each other along in those nudges. So yes, me. Attained a few of my skills along the way, working in maintenance and airfield and systems and whatever. Got the opportunity to bag myself a master's in construction. On the back of that, distance learning through, the, through work, up and down to Harriet Watt, got into the major construction team. Boy, I loved it. <laughs> really, really good. Egan Report, um, rethinking construction, really thinking about innovation, thinking about high-performing teams, all around teamwork and working not at ad adversarial level with the, consult with the contractors and the, con and the consultants, but all around what's the ultimate aim and how do we want to get there. That was the most thing, most important thing that I learnt, that team of working as a high-performing entity. I think that it wasn't that, well, we're going to jump on your back to be visible in this way and whatever. It was all around the success of the outcome. But then I was also given Y2K, it came along. All the SCADA systems, all the safety critical systems, and I got baggage. Baggage is... Um, yeah, safety critical for us, apart from runways. We hit, <laughs> we hit uh, I got Terminal 4, and I got all 1, 2, and 3, and all the existing systems. Thankfully, it was okay. But we did have to do some changes. We did have to make sure that things were done. All part of the learning, and I think this is where we sometimes don't share the stories of what, what we were encountering over time, and where I turn around and go, I don't know what we're doing. What do we think? What's the repercussions of getting that many bags into Heathrow at that time? How many short ship? How will we get them out? And certainly, at the time, we own the baggage system, so the clarity of client versus um, British Airways, who was, the, um, who was actually, um, we were the provider to them, was rather adversarial. But for this project, they were so dependent that we actually then worked with them on that. But generally... It wasn't so many, such an easy ride. So managing teams and programs, I'd say high performing is one of the most critical things that makes the difference to the work environment and makes you feel that you want to go into work. It makes you feel that that's the sense of success, that you're, you're actually succeeding together. That whole enjoyment, that peace of being able to feel. that The group of the individuals that I met in that room when they were talking about their space information, the first person, um, and I'll quote it specifically, the first person described it, and then the second person, who I assume was more senior, um, turned around and said, there's not much more I can add to this because you seem to have explained it eloquently, but he really wanted to explain things. And he then took us into an arena where I thought he was going quite technical for where I was going, but I felt I needed to let him speak because the first one had, had actually just done a superb job in being able to take me in the overall picture and just explaining it. But the other one felt equally wanting to there, be there. And I don't know whether they're here today, but <laughs> if they are, <laughs> I don't want to say that it was that. <laughs> I don't want to say that. But it, it was just the dynamics and just watching that they were all both passionate about wanting to share. So then, while I was at the airport, so I decided I want to learn about organisational design and redevelopment of structures. What does that mean? Well, it meant restructuring a maintenance department that's highly unionised and um, are not happy at having a woman boss. So on reflection, I think uh, this was a big job for me and I think I needed a mentor. I probably needed a coach. I probably needed a, a somebody on the sidelines thinking that they were there to help me through this emotional roller coaster. I was, um, I found it tough. Um, my boss wasn't the most, um, he was just a JFDI and he would use um, acronyms that, or he would use words that were very flowery and we'd all have to stand in a room and we would be in the war room as such and we'd have to explain how our performance was doing and you had half an hour and he was um, a different sort of person. He'd come from, I think he came from Ford at the time. Yes, he came from Ford. Um, It made me stronger. It made me more resilient. It made me feel that, yes, I could do it. 
Did I feel I succeeded? No, I don't think I did. I certainly changed it. I certainly learnt loads. I know what I need to do next time. But that's what I need to recognise, that it's... I got the scars. I got the pain. I got the unions turning round and almost undermining me every day. I got the individuals who didn't want to use tablets to record their time, who didn't want to actually um, fulfil job cards that were all automated, didn't want to step away from having their bacon butty sandwiches at 10am and going to the canteen or finishing at 3, didn't want to chain any of those practices. Would I say that I was able to change all of that? No. Would I say I know what to do this time? Probably. Would I say I want to do that again? Maybe. <laughs> People management's tough. And I'm not sure I was cut out for this at the time, but I'd say resilience is one of the things that needs to happen. So on the back of that, after that whole myriad of time, um, redundancy was on offer. Took it, in a, took it in a heartbeat and thought, right, I'm not going to do this anymore. Didn't know what I was going to do. But what I did do was um, recognise that I had experience of bids, I had experience of airports and qualifications. And, and what I didn't say was while I was doing that last change piece, I was also doing an MBA. So I also got an MBA on the back of that. I do hear that many women often speak of the balance of families and children and the compromises they have to make in their careers and often watch their peers as they pr get promoted and succeed because they've taken time out and have that emotional sort of wrenching feeling when they look at LinkedIn and they see their colleague who, if anything, they got the better grades than them and they got their better, they got the better jobs but had to take time out. It's mental torture. And I started to, started to read, and that's where you start to use that media, social media, and you see people getting the qualifications. And I took about two years out, did adopt a little boy. That was another fork in the road. It's not plain sailing when you adopt, and it's not plain sailing when you do all of these things, but we thought, right, that's what we're going to do. I still had my little black book with all the contacts, and I also had that sense of, well... I can sell myself, I can look at other sectors, and I can do something. So I looked at the advert, there was an advert for housing, got an on-exec position from the Sunday Times, that was a cold call, no contacts, whatever. Thought, right, got it. Learnt about, and I was asking the questions, how much social housing is on the land that you're actually developing, I was learning all about the student accommodation, I was learning about customer engagement. I knew that when I put my CV together, it was all around customer engagement and construction and maintenance. Those were the three bits that I could actually sell myself on. So I could sell myself in the non-exec environment. Didn't know the governance bits and pieces that sat within that. I'd sat to senior level at the airports, but didn't have that governance of acting as a non-exec, where you don't get your hands dirty, roll your sleeves up and actually get involved. Totally different style, different environment. But did that for a couple of years while... The little one was still getting to know us and all of that. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough because you feel you want to work. You've earned your stripes. You've, earned your, um, you've got your education and you feel you want to earn some money and, and do something. That's not enough because they'll go to school and you still want to do something. So decided, yes, going to go. Go and go and work in the interim environment. NHS, very parochial, very closeted. If you don't have an NHS experience, you're not in the door. They don't take any sort of anyone. So, in effect, it can be quite incestuous. Uh, <laughs> I would say that I got in because somebody else, I knew a couple of people who had also taken the redundancy package, who got in and then said, right, this is how you do it. I'll take you in on the first one. Then you go out and you do your own thing. So it's maintaining those contacts because you just don't know where your contacts are going to land. It could be even your neighbour, but it's anywhere that may well be able to tell you then do this. So, got into the contracting market. Never done it before. Emotionally, it's a lovely thing to do. You're earning a nice packet, you're working for yourself or whatever. But I always had that point when the contract wasn't renewed. You took that as a personal slight. You thought, well... I'm not good enough, even though it may well have been it was only for a short period of six months or a year or whatever. You felt that, 
what have I done wrong? And that's equally, people don't say that. When they know, they go, yeah, yeah, dust yourself off, off you go again. But I started to build a rapport with a certain um, recruiter who said, right, I can get you into this one, I can get you into that one, and we, I started to build that rapport. So with that in mind, I'd been working in the airport, then the health sector, and the, uh, but I found that in the health sector, very silo-driven, very vertical, still is. Everyone's specialist, everyone thinks in that way, and it's a tough environment to operate in. There's so many different clients, there's so many different... I can, you can start with PCTs, then you move to CCGs, now you're moving with STPs, and, and the acronyms are enormous. And even now that I keep looking at it, I keep thinking, at the moment, I'm trying to land an estate strategy, and uh, London has five SDPs, there are 32 boroughs, there are this, and I've got to actually see, well, who is my client? Is it the mayor and the GLA office, or is it somewhere else? But at the moment, there's a lot of integration, and there's lots of people who operate in this space. So moving back, it was around, well, okay, I wanted to then say, right, let me think about, well, I did the contracting, and I, and I thought, nah, I want to do something else, and I got involved a bit with the Women's Engineering Society. Started to see that, okay, they needed volunteers, and they also, the president's post came about, and so I said, hand up, I'll do it, I'll have a go. What I didn't realise was, when you work in large organisations, people, there are people to help you doing things. Whereas here, it's, you write your own thing, you make this, you have to know the governance, you have to know your M&As, you have to do your legal, you have to, if you have to let go of people and you have to know, well, where am I going to... And because we're such a small organisation, you have to go and ask people for help. And so it's a totally different environment of how you do it. And so I did that, and I've been doing that, and I do end my term in um, October this year. But what I've found is that it's given me a whole new insight into what women encounter in their environments. So I did some judging last year for WIC, which is one of the um, sort of, it looks at women who then do a pitch and actually uh, in construction and engineering. And I met one of them and she said, I'm working in the Northeast for a, con for a contractor and um, I'm from Cyprus and I'm finding that it's a hostile environment. It's hostile, it's painful and I'm really having trouble. And you just thought, I can pick up a phone to that company and that organisation because I know people. And I was able to do that and said, look, she's a capable individual. You might want to take her out of that environment and put her into somewhere that she's going to flourish. And that's the thing. When you hear people saying things, sometimes I'm able to do something, but sometimes you just think there are individuals who fall by the wayside and it's tough. Um, and they don't know who to ask. And that, I was able to do something, but... I do get others where I get refugees and I know that Arcadia and various people, refugees are saying, well, we're engineers. They're trying to then get land their jobs and they say, we're, we live, and they happen to be living in Brighton, and we're both engineers, I'm a design engineer and I'm there, but what can I do and how do I get my place so I can actually work? That's all I want to do. I want to provide for my family. And you think, we've got a shortage. There's a shortage in this country. You must be able to find ways of people being able to provide for themselves and not feel that they're actually a burden on society because all they want to do is, like me, use my skills to be able to provide for myself. <coughs> so I, we looked at sort of examples like Thames Tideway, Crossrail, and they've done huge amounts of work in the area of high-performing teams. And if I look at the people in those organisations, they happen to be a lot of people who were my cohorts and my peers previously. They've got 30% of women, but the point is, those high-performing teams, when you're in a construction environment, they break away. And so you're almost having to start again. So those are the discussions we're starting to have with some of the large organisations on how can we hold people so they're able to still maintain their ability to perform as high-performing, especially in the construction sector when you know that a job ends and then you all go to the respective four corners of the wherever. What we also know are that girls are selecting maths and physics at a slightly greater number than boys. But as fast as we're filling the bucket, it's leaking out the bottom. And it is leaking out. We also do know that women are leaving the profession for a multitude of reasons. And we've found that institutions especially are not getting renewals for their institutional and professional um, fees 
in the 40s. So we can see that it's not holding in that arena for the women. So we need to be starting to have these debates. And this is where the advantage is I can be a bit of a disruptor. I can start to just challenge, but I'm not sure we're landing it as yet. And I think by sharing this, it's more around you might have a way of being able to influence in whatever sphere you operate in. And that's all I ask, that if we all consider it in that way, we're able to do it. And then the other thing that I, we look at is also building people's careers. And we have started looking at STEM returners because there is this market. It is small, but it's that sense of STEM returning and people then saying, taking time out and finding ways, and especially women where they've had time out, and finding those ways of coming in and then being able to have an internship for a period and then being able to go back into the working environment. But going back to the fellowship, my IT fellowship, got my fellowship, got my little badge, and then I said, I went and saw the CEO and said, what do you want me to do? And there isn't that sense of, well, we'd like you to go and do this, or we'd like you to go and do that. And I think that's the bit that sometimes we need to think about, well, if we're giving people the opportunity and giving them the accolade, well, we think you should be actually doing this supporting level or that, that would actually aid in the thought around how we use people in that volunteering. And I don't think we've got it right in Women's Engineering Society, but I still think that there has to be some thought around this as well. And that could well be for your alumni or all those various places and however you place that. We know there's, what, a shortage of 50,000 engineers a year, uh, including applied scientists. We know that Generation Z operate in a totally different way in the way that they think. But also what we know is that there is a certain level of disruptiveness in the way that we're wanting to use technology. And I think often we do fall back on convention. It's that convention of we recruit from certain places, we actually then go and model it based on the same type of environment, and we do a lot of that without necessarily knowing. And we often do the same in the way that we are, make our friends because they are who we feel comfortable with. I'll use the example of a little project I did with Jaguar Land Rover, and that was they were looking for 5,000 electronic and software jobs for people. They knew that in the tech sector, they would always be getting the people that they would always get, and they were always going to be a small number, that they would, wouldn't be able to find those 5,000. So what they did was they heard, I don't know whether you've heard of the band Gorillaz. What they did was they enlisted the band Gorillaz to help them, and one of, the, one of those virtual band members is called Noodle. And Noodle, actually, she is the guitarist. And what they did was, instead of having that whole concept, it was all on virtual reality, and then from that, it was that individuals had to go through a gaming process. So it was all gaming. On the back of that, they were able to then find different individuals who wouldn't have gone through their normal recruitment process, and they got a different selection of people. And they were in, in, in individuals who they could take through their apprenticeship program. But what it did was firstly, find people who wanted to be that innovator, wanted to try different things, but also wouldn't have had the CV to have even got them through the first front door. And that's the bit, it's finding different places, knowing where they've got to go. And it worked very well. I was quite surprised. I believe they had somebody in the Midlands and they thought, he wouldn't have, we wouldn't have even considered him. He wasn't a, a person who was articulate, didn't have the CV or whatever. When they saw what scores he got on the gaming and stuff, they were just absolutely mesmerised. So it's those sorts of things that actually then play out. And I think that's the point when we're all trying to compete in a marketplace when we want to differentiate what those jobs are. So Michelle Obama summed it beautifully for me. If you're sitting in a decision room and everyone looks like you and thinks like you, you'll come up with less than a good answer. She said... You need all voices around the table, and to make the best decisions. Put simply, you'll get a better result. Sometimes, it's just too big a question to influence, too hard for you to change, but she said, people sometimes need to think change, only think about change on a big scale. But I'd say, the influence you have, and she described it specifically, she said she has the most influence on her two daughters, and I'd say, replace it with friends, colleagues, workmates, and if you do have daughters, do the same for them. 
to allies. A niece, my niece, and, and this was quite funny because I didn't realise, she, she actually wrote to the ex-president of the United States, seven-year-old that she is, and she asked, why was Mr Trump elected? <laughs> <laughs> and this is what he wrote back, and, and this is a really sweet one. He wrote back and made, and it really was quite fascinating. He said, the power of education opens doors. It's a foundation for achievement. It's the best investment we can make for a nation and ourselves. You and your classmates are tomorrow's leaders. And your generation, in all its creativity, ingenuity and selflessness, gives me tremendous hope for the future. There are no limits. Reach for the stars. OK, so he was a bit sort of vanilla-ish in that arena. But she walked away thinking, I've, I got a letter back again. She looked at it and thought, I can do anything. And it was that whole sense of... He wrote back, and, and I think some of those things, she'll keep it, she'll remember it, and she is, um, she is severely dyslexic, actually, and it was tough for her to write, but she will cher cherish it, and it will make her think about what else she can do. So as I look at, on this and the changing behaviour, well, what is it that we look for? There is a person called Vincent Vigo, and he said... We educate engineers, and I, I think I want you to challenge me on this. We educate engineers for the 21st century, using 20th century curriculum in 19th century universities. But here today, what do I see? <laughs> <laughs> so I would like you to, to think about, especially in the creative sphere, that we think around the critical thinking, the creativity, the empathy, and, and all the collaboration around that softer skills of problem solving. I want us to actually then consciously think around that space. Thinking around the organisational, the communication and the interpersonal and consciously get people to recognise that these are the skills that they may well be using but they may not be able to be labelling it. By labelling it then that actually gives them that sense of well is this what I did where and how and what? It gives them that ability to then differentiate and understand what that means. So I would say for future engineering grads, or just generally, reflection, relationships, resilience. Those are the three powerful R's that I would hold true to me. And ultimately, I would say luck has been on my side. Thank you. <laughs>